dear guest, a special welcome to you as well. We're in a new series called 13 Questions. 13 questions that impact our lives. 13 questions that are that need to be in our spiritual toolbox if we're going to walk toward people, toward Jesus, if we're going to become disciple makers and disciples who make disciples, these are needed to walk with people. But even for parents, recognize something. Your students and your children need to understand these 13 questions as well. But let me begin by just putting them on the screen just for review here. The number one there, what's your definition of God? This is a biggie. It impacts every other question. See, is your God a type of genie or Santa Claus where you rub the prayer lamp and he's supposed to fix and answer you the way he want, you want it to? Or maybe he's kind of a distant force type of God. He's way up there, but he just doesn't care. He, he's not personable. Or maybe, which I, this next one I think is the most pronounced, but many people think that God is a type of cop. He has a radar gun pointing it at you, watching you to see if he can give you a ticket if you do some kind of a moral sin. Or do you believe what Jesus reveals about the Father? Jesus revealed that we have a loving Father who is looking to care for us deeply and profoundly. But that second question, what's your understanding of baggage and recognizing your stuff? And the, the third one, what's your working definition of sin? We looked at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Throw off the weight, the baggage in our lives. Recognize there's stuff in our lives that keep us from running toward Jesus. But then there's the sin in our life that also holds us back from running toward Christ. Do we recognize the depth of those things? And even for sin, I, I think people keep sin on the moral level and they don't understand that ultimately it's a deep form of self-love and claiming the right to decide what life, how life should work. Then the fourth one last week. What's your understanding of the flesh? Residual all the way back from Adam and Eve that within us there's this battle between the flesh and the Holy Spirit but thanks to God for giving us the spirit that we can actually win those battles. So I would encourage you maybe to go back and catch up on some of those if you haven't listened to them online as well. But to begin here this morning, think about a scenario like this. Maybe you were on the way to church, you're going to work, and you, you head out to the car, and as you're approaching the car, you look down at the tires, a flat tire. What's your emotional response at that point? You know, what happens? Or maybe, what about this? Maybe you're in high school or college and you get to the class that day and the teacher says, pull out a sheet of paper. We're having a quiz on the reading assignment and you haven't read the assignment. What is the emotional response? Now we have a bunch of teachers in our congregation and they just do that on purpose, just for the emotional response, I know that. Or how about this one? You go on a nice vacation, you have a great time, and you come home, and then you take, you go, and then all of a sudden you step on that scale. Three pounds up. Anybody ever done that besides me? What's your reaction at that point? Aren't most of those a type of negative emotion that comes through? But let me go at a different angle here. Let me put a question on the screen. What makes you happy? Now, happiness and joy are different. What makes you happy? What puts a smile on your face? Not a flat tire in the morning. Not a quiz from that teacher. See, recognize being human and living in this world, we prefer things that make us happy, don't we? By the way, you do know that happiness is also a personal right, don't you? Right? Let me show you. Look at what the Founding Fathers wrote. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There it is. 
The founding father says the creator wants you to have a goal to pursue happiness. But we're human. We would rather be happy than sad, right? See, can we acknowledge that we want life to work well for us, to give us happiness? But realize there's another desire for, in terms of being human, and it's the desire for some type of meaning in our life. There's a word called significance. That really is that issue of what we do gives some sense of purpose. It, it satisfies some sense of meaning in terms of our lives. You know, have you ever had a job where it didn't fit you and there was no meaning, no satisfaction? You know, we moved to Vancouver, Washington when we were young and Deanna and I, uh, or Deanna went actually into premature labor. I didn't have a job. She was on bed rest. Uh, I was hoping to get my teaching license so I could start at least subbing out there, but didn't come. And money was really tight. And God had to convince me that I needed to do anything, any kind of work to bring in some money. So I ended up getting a job at a nursing home working nights. Now, my job was to do this, to go around from room to room and check to see if they were either wet or soiled and then change them. Now, um, I'll tell you what, that job, there was no sense of meaning for me. There, there was, it didn't make me happy. Now, I, I recognize something. There are caregivers out there who's who love to care, and even that job can have a sense of meaning for some people. But for myself, man, dunking a basketball was much more meaningful for me in that context. But let me put up a statement then that applies to us here. We long for happiness and meaning in this world, but life will never fully cooperate. Is that true? You know, my mom and dad, they had hopes to retire and my dad retired at 62, and the desire was to go south for the winter. So they bought a, a, a trailer in 19, or in six, when my dad was 62, and that was the same year he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Used it one time to go south, never again. See, there was little meaning and little happiness in getting Alzheimer's. My mom had to make adjustments and see this curve was, curveball was thrown at her. Her happiness and meaning as this world defines it, it went right out the window. She had to start a whole new chapter in her life. She had a lesson to learn that was deep. Matter of fact, she was confronted with question number five. Let me put it on the screen. The fifth question of 13, what is your definition of what it means to walk by faith? Understand, there's a deep intersection between walking by faith and the quest for meaning and happiness. Let me show you one text that actually speaks to this. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Solomon writes, the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises, and the wind blows to the south and to the north. Around and around it goes, ever returning on its course. Now, if you don't know, this is wisdom literature. It's real, it's raw, it's painful at times. I, I, I'll, it kind of is a downer. Whenever I read it, I feel like it, it doesn't drive you toward happiness. Solomon devoted, though, his whole life to these questions. Where is the meaning? Where's the meaning in life? Where do I find happiness? See, he was born wealthy. He had plenty of money. He could pay for every passion and every desire that he wanted. And he discovered that life was shallow and meaningless apart from God. Now, here's the problem. 
There are way too many people in churches today that are trying to live life like Solomon. The goal for way too many Christians is find a meaningful life that I can enjoy and pursue happiness. In how we define it. Not necessarily how Jesus defines it or the Bible defines it. See, Solomon didn't find it till the very end of his life. And at the end, it was kind of like, oh yeah, meaning is found in the Lord. He's finally discovered that. See, the reality of this world, even from a very young age, life throws curveballs at us. And they hit us squarely in the eyes, and it hurts. Folks, that happened for my mom. She never planned my dad's Alzheimer's. She was looking forward to a glorious retirement. But just ponder other stuff. Think of children that are born and SIDS, a death or even an unborn child as dies. A marriage dies. For parents, kids turn their backs and walk away from Jesus and walk into a lifestyle that God says is clearly sinful. Some of you have experienced that. See, this question is so important for every person who claims to be a follower of Christ. What does it mean to walk by faith? In a fallen and broken world, what is your definition today? Let me give you what it is not. In your notes, I said it this way. Walking by faith is not centered in the ability to think positive thoughts. It's not in the power of positivity. Now, positive thinking isn't bad. Negative does no good either. You know, there's a well-known preacher on TV. Just think positive thoughts, and you're going to find release and happiness. The bad will go away if you just think positive. Remember that obnoxious song, Just Be Happy? Anybody, anybody like that one? I want to know. Oh, Jim, get rid of it. Come on. <laughs> Jesus loves that song. Uh, no. <laughs> I don't know if you know where the power of positive thinking comes from. It's interesting, many of you are younger won't know the name, but this guy by the name of Norman Vincent Peale. He wrote the little book's guideposts. You understand that? And he believed that your thoughts could become causative, that our thoughts can change our destiny. Readers and followers, you know, they were thrilled because he taught if you believed it, you could have it, or be it, or do it. Now there's a, a slight problem with this philosophy. It, it, it's, it's the Bible. The Bible is a problem. Uh, but it's, he recognized this. I don't care how many positive thoughts my mom would have thought, it would not stop her, the Alzheimer's from my dad. Now again, I'm not saying that we go around thinking negative thoughts. That's not the point. But this this issue is not binary. It's either think positive or think negative. Folks, there's another path that we got to figure out, and it is how do we walk by faith in a broken world? Let me get fill in that next blank, because there is a truth that is really hard that we forget, and it's this. As believers in Christ, the world is broken, and followers of Christ are not exempt from pain, heartache and, heartache, and suffering. And because of that truth, we got to answer this question. It's critical the way we live in this world. Now, too often, I, I think people, as I listen, people use it as a type of cliche. You know, they'll go up to somebody and go, well, you just need to walk by faith. But what does that really mean? For some of them, it just means think positive thoughts. Tomorrow will get better. And tomorrow comes, and it doesn't get better. See, there's a pattern for some. When life goes bad, some even do it this way. They turn to other people and say, you got to make me happy. You got to give me meaning. 
you got to come through for me. But we recognize as we turn to people, guess what? People let us down. Relationships, it's normal. It happens in this world. Whether you're married, whether it's your friends, your bosses, your personal heroes in the faith, they can let you down. So let me today give you some characteristics and try to unpack this just a little bit more today. So if in your bulletin, I got number one there, characteristics of walking by faith. Walking by faith first is trusting in the person, the person of God, not just faith in faith. I'm just going to believe the positive thinking. See, walking by faith begins by trusting in the person of God himself. Positive thoughts may have nothing to do with that. Let me show you one text, Romans 10, 11. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disappointed. Now, does it mean that you might have sorrow? Sure. But if we trust in God, we do not have to be disappointed. Remember when I said, though, our view of God actually intersects deeply with these questions? See, understand this. If your God is a moral cop and hard stuff comes into your life and you wonder, did he just give me a speeding ticket? Or maybe something I did in the past, therefore he's punishing me. Or maybe your, your view of God is that Santa Claus, the genie view. He didn't give me what I wanted, therefore now I'm disappointed. You put expectations on God. Matter of fact, maybe I should get, should get angry at him. But let me ask this morning, what are you putting your trust in? See, that's the hard question. What are you trusting so life works? If not God, let me make a statement, it will disappoint you. It will disappoint your spouse, your job, your pleasures, your goals. They all will be fleeting in terms of really a walk of faith. Solomon tried to put his faith and trust in, you think of it, relationships with women, pleasure, power, even wisdom and learning. And the response was, it's meaningless. It didn't work. It's vanity. If you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. We want to unpack just a couple of verses here this morning. And it, it so speaks to what it means to walk by faith here. 1 Peter 1, verse 20. Look at how Peter writes. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, meaning Jesus, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now notice that 20 first. Jesus was made known for our benefit. Very important. But then we come to verse 21. So, you see those two words? So that. It gives us a description of things about Jesus. So that faith and hope can come from positive thinking. No. No, it's God. You catch that? There's the person of God, not the idea of faith and faith, not wishful thinking, faith in God. And the question, do we really know God personally? Not just a concept in our minds. But let me give you a couple of key things here. The context, I don't know if you know this from First Peter. He's writing to a group of Christians where life isn't working well. It's shattered. They were being persecuted for their faith. There was no happy life here, folks. But let me show you chapter 2 here. Peter is really unpacking a theology of suffering. 
Some um, on my list someday is to go after this book. But I, I, here's where some people have been taught. But can Christians shouldn't have to suffer? We have a right to happiness. But look at First Peter two twenty. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ is also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. To this you have been called, both to suffer and endure it, just like Christ, who is our example. See, do we believe those early Christians, their main purpose in life was to be happy? No, you know what? They were just trying to survive their world. They were being persecuted. They were being put to death for their faith. The only thing that they could do was walk toward Jesus and with Jesus to move toward the Father. Did they know the outcome? No. It's so critical. They didn't know the outcome. Sometimes it was death. Sometimes it was death, and they still walked toward Jesus. See, to this you've been called suffering. See, most times suffering and happy are not in the same box. We're called to suffer really in two ways here. I, I, I think it's this. First, we just live in a broken world. We've got to admit that. But second here, Peter's writing, because you claim Jesus, you may have to suffer. Now here, we get by with so little of it in, in terms of our faith. I think it's coming in a more difficult way in days ahead. Matter of fact, though, I think what we do is we try to avoid both of them. Let's just avoid people. Let's not be vocal with their faith. Let's just, and then we try to avoid even this broken world. See, the question, when life goes down the toilet, do you seek the person of God, the Father, Son, Spirit? Or do you, you go toward happy thoughts? Or do you go toward pleasure to block it off, block it out? Do you run away from the pain and move toward despair? You know, last week, James 4, draw near to him. He will draw near to you. That is a promise. That is critical for walking by faith. See, but it has an object of God himself. And when pain hits, we are called to run toward him. See, is your life centered on walking toward God, fulfilling its purposes even in your life? So that our meaning is not what we define meaning, but it's what God defines meaning even in our lives. But there's some other beliefs in walking by faith as well. Second one here for your notes, walking by faith demands a trust, a trust in an objective certainty, and that's the person of God. But it's this issue of trust. Now you'll notice there in 21, it uses faith and hope. But if you understand that word faith there, that is not a saving faith. That's not what he's talking about here and all, at all. Matter of fact, I looked up that word, and I want to show you a biblical dictionary of that word, what it means. Look at how it reads. Faith, belief with the predominant idea of trust, confidence, whether in God or in Christ, springing from faith in the same. The next one, fidelity, faithfulness, in the character of the one who can be relied on. There's the person of God again. See, functionally, that word faith there, you could equal that word to trust. Trust and hope. It's why our definition, though, of God is so critical. If God is a God of, of a genie and we rub the, you know, the prayer bottle and more suffering comes out, what do we do? See, if God is a genie, Trust begins to fade. Trust begins to fade. And even we could even move toward anger. It didn't come through. Folks, the only way walking by faith works if it's we believe and are convinced that God is a loving Father. 
It is crucial. Without him being a loving father, you will never sense his care during hard times and pain. You won't believe that father knows best. Yeah, it's a TV show, but there's a huge reality of the truth that God, the Father, knows best in our lives and what we're going through. The very nature of God as Father is the one who loves. So do we trust God that he is a Father that knows and knows us and intersects with our hearts? But this, guys, this isn't more than an intellectual knowing. This is within the heart in the soul. And it's why we must pursue God. Allow him to show us that he's a loving father. And the spirit within us, that battle with the flesh and the spirit, the spirit is going, he is a good father. He is a good God. You can trust him. And the flesh is going, no, 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 don't trust him. That's what the flesh lies to us about. See, but this is about our hearts, not just purely an intellectual thing in the head. Matter of fact, he, he, working in marriages all these years, a struggle, I hear this. Let me kind of give an illustration. I, I will hear people say this. I'm trusting with God. I'm trusting God. I'm walking by faith, but I won't love my spouse. You catch the problem with that? I'm walking by faith, but I will not be obedient with the call to love and forgive and do what you're calling me to do. That's not walking by faith, folks, in a marriage. That's the opposite. See, if we're not willing to do what's biblical because we don't, we don't understand the outcome of it, because we don't know the outcome. If I love my spouse, what will happen? Don't know. See, there's an obedience element in terms of walking by faith. Trust God for the outcome, no matter what. See, obedience comes in, but we have to be pursuing him in this. And it's giving up the results. The results to him. God, you determine the results. But he, last night, I added a, a statement here, and I'm going to put it on the screen. Because I think we struggle, and we don't catch something when we're younger, especially younger in the faith. Because there's a better way to live, especially for you that are younger in your age right now. Here's what I would say. Pursue God before we have the big troubles come into our lives. Now, I see people and the Spirit is working, the trouble comes in, and it launches them to pursue God. But I also see this. Those that have pursued God and trouble comes in, they respond differently profoundly differently. It's, the why, it's why we need to allow people in our lives to walk with us, to challenge us, to, to disciple us, to move in our faith in such a way that it's lived out every day. Every day. But keep going here. Look at verse 21. Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Realize there's something more than just trusting God and faith in God. It's this issue of hope. Let, let me fill in the blank there for you, number three. Because God is trustworthy, we walk by faith and have hope for the future. See, if we don't have hope, we really can't claim to be walking by faith. Hope is included in that term. Hope, it's not just a cliche, it's hope, why? Because of God. It's not just trusting in something good is around the corner. It's in the person of God is that pursuit is connected to this issue of hope. Now we gotta catch something. 
Hope again is pointing to the future. The trust is really the immediate, the events that are going on right now. But here's how some operate. We, oh, I just hope that tomorrow is better. And I go, no, that's not walking by faith. We have hope for the future. Why? Because we are walking with Jesus to meet the Father. And he's changing us. And he's giving us hope. See, hope is the ability to trust God for the future. When the future comes. And then when the future comes, then it switches over to trust. In fact, look at Matthew chapter 6. I've used this lots of times over the years. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And then verse 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Hard text. See, we litter our minds with worry about tomorrow. What if? What if? What if? And you go, that's not walking by faith. It's walking by sight. Yeah, maybe things, I'm hoping that they'll change tomorrow. That's not faith. See, Peter tells us we have hope for tomorrow when we're walking toward him and making him the object of our faith. We have hope, why? Because to, when tomorrow comes, we can say this, when we know him, God is trustworthy. And then when next week comes, we can say, God is trustworthy. And next year comes, we'll say, God is trustworthy. Because he is a good father. He is a good God. And there's a certainty in it. See, walking by faith is actually setting aside the desire to know the outcome in the future. And that is so hard for us living on this earth but we're going to be okay with not knowing it. Do we have to battle to get there at times? Yeah. Do I have to battle to get there? Yes. But see, I, here's where I want to dig just a little bit more this morning because these verses actually give evidence of why we can trust him, why we can have hope. I don't know if you caught that. Look at the phrase in 21. Let me put it on the screen. First of all, he gives these kind of three little topics here, these three points as to why we can have faith and hope. Look at verse 21, who through him are believers in God, through Jesus are believers. That's talking about salvation there. For your notes there, letter A, I said it this way. Why is God trustworthy for the present and the future? Because saving faith came from him. A loving father began a spiritual work in us. And if, it did, if he didn't, we wouldn't have it. Let, let me show you a passage, Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah and one of the prophets. Well, what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Peter, my Father in heaven started your faith. And he began a good work in you, and he's going to complete it. That's what Paul understood. But keep going. Look at 1 Peter 1.21 again. Who raised this phrase? Who raised him from the dead? 
and gave him glory so that faith and hope are in God. Let letter B for your notes. We can walk by faith because of the power demonstrated by the cross. Folks, that cross, we have coming Easter here in a month or so. Do we recognize that this issue of the resurrection is, has to be certain in our hearts? You know, there are churches out here, there right now who say this. It doesn't matter. The resurrection, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. I go, then they have no hope. They have no real faith. The resurrection matters. Just, that's why we need to come back to it. It's why communion, next week when we celebrate communion, remember these things. What? The resurrection of Jesus. But look at Philippians chapter 3, how Paul understood it even. He understood that there's something about the resurrection that's incredible. I want to know Christ. Yes, and look at this, to know Christ, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. Do you catch Paul welcomes suffering here? I want to know the power of the resurrection, he's asking. See, death has been defeated, folks, for my mom. My mom actually died of kidney cancer. So for my dad and my mom, for both of them, I recognize this, that death was defeated. It was defeated for them, even though they died on this earth. Why? Because they have a saving faith in the one that was resurrected. That power changed them. And death was defeated for them. One more phrase, though. You notice, and I'm not going to put it on the screen, it, it's so that it, he gave him glory. Now, you go, what is that all about? Let her see. Let me just fill in the blank. We can walk by faith because we can see the glory and the greatness of Jesus. You know, we, I try to make a big deal of Jesus around here. I understand Jesus, again, in, in these couple of verses, he was sent. God started the work, the resurrection of Jesus but understand this, there's this issue of glory, and you go, what does this mean? Well, one way to look at it is this. Recognize that Jesus was not the first one that was resurrected. Lazarus is an example. There were others. But do you realize something about Lazarus? Yeah, he, he was dead, he came to life, and then he got old and died again. He died again. Jesus did not. He went to the throne of the Father. He went back to his Father, and he is sitting on the throne, and he is inviting us to come and sit and bow before the throne and to see his greatness, his goodness, his love, his compassion, his mercy, his power. He wants us to see that in him. The Father wants to glorify the Son and for us to see that glory because it draws us to Jesus himself. See, we look to Jesus, and when we see the beauty of who he is, we begin to go, okay, this is why I'm going to pursue you, Jesus. You will be the one that will help me walk by faith with the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. We trust him, and trust comes with no matter what happens in our lives, the outcome. I'm going to ask the worship team to climb up. See, as we begin to walk by faith, uh, happiness really isn't the issue. Joy can be there in the midst of suffering. Worship can be there in the midst of suffering. But here's, here's where I want to end with an illustration that I use oftentimes. And just to kind of nail it down here, recognize again, trusting God for the outcome. But if I, did, if I darkened this whole room, took out the chairs, and where it was complete blackness. Have you ever been in a cave or somewhere where you know, they turn off the lights and you can't see nothing? You can't see your hand in front of your face. But if I created that kind of darkness, and I dug a hole in the middle, and I put some spears in there that's going up, and you know that that potential suffering event is there. 
And Jesus comes along and says, Ken, trust me. Trust me. Walk, move, pursue. Don't stay paralyzed. You know, we kind of plant our feet and we go, well, he wants me to move, to trust. So then we, we, we slide real slow, feel for the hole. And then we hopefully get to the wall and then we go along the wall and then we want to flip the light on. Oh, then I will walk with you, Jesus. Folks, walking by faith is, you don't know the outcome. You don't know the outcome. And we will all be there at some point. If you have never experienced it yet, you will get there. As we get older, we're reminded of that every day. My, di my dad died at 69, planning a glorious retirement. And I'm 65. Will I live that long? I don't know. But folks, he cares for us. This is why we must have a loving father. And we must say he is worthy and he's trustworthy. And we can walk with him completely, even if we don't have the answers. Why? Because he is trustworthy and he is good. He is so good. We got to walk. Can't be paralyzed. Can't be despair. We despair. Happiness is not the issue. We can have sorrow and still trust. You know, I think of Job. One last, uh, this just came to my mind. When you think of Job losing everything, everything. Uh, this picture of so much faith. You remember what he did? They finally tell him, you know, all your kids are dead. All your stuff is gone. And he shaved his head and he bowed before on the ground and he worshiped God and he said this, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Folks, that's what God can do with us as we walk toward him, pursue him. We need to sing and respond. Folks, we have a good God. And if you sense that in your heart, sing to him, glorify him, give him his due. He loves us and he cares for us. Let's stand and let's sing. We have a good father who watches over us, he guards us, and he wants us to walk by faith. But it's our part is walking toward him. And he gives us trust and he becomes the object that we trust him every day. That's where we gotta go. And then as we look to the future, we don't know the outcome, but we do what's right. We do what the Bible teaches us. So as we walk by faith, trust and hope change our lives every day, no matter what. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage that Peter wrote for us, that understands that you are the object of what it means to walk by faith not faith and faith. It's not power and positive thinking, but you are the person that we walk towards. And you've given us the Holy Spirit to walk toward you. So Lord, would you teach us to listen? When the hard times come in our lives, would you teach us to hear and slow down, hear your voice through the Spirit that says, obey me, trust me. I'm there for you. So Father, we thank you for again for being the God who cares. And we give this day to you. We give this week to you. And in our weakness, would you just help us to walk by faith every day through every circumstance. These things we pray now in your name. Amen. If you don't know somebody around you, just greet them. Give them an elbow bump or something. But uh, have a great week. Walk toward Jesus this week and trust him.